Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. God, God has equipped us with every spiritual gift that comes from above is what the word says. The problem that we have is that on this earth, Satan can care less if you read your Bible. Satan can care less if you go to church. But a praying believer, oh my God, you are all powerful. When a church knows how to pray, remember, you have to think this. Prayer is literally what opens heaven for us. Prayer is what keeps us connected with God. Prayer is what builds the relationship and the intimacy with God. The moment we take prayer out of our relationship with God is the moment that the enemy comes in. And so we have to understand that as we get into this new series, which kicks off today, 50 Shades of Prey, I'm going to spend the next few weeks and really just um, unfold and and give us some maybe uh, clear direction and maybe some revelation for someone that maybe is not used to being a, a person who prays on a consistent basis. Or maybe you're someone here that you're saying, I already know how to pray. Well, that's great. Aren't you glad that you can always up your prayer life? You can always elevate your prayer life. You can never have enough prayer, right? And so these next few weeks, we're going to break down every uh, single style of prayer because there are different styles of prayer. I also want to hit this big one that uh, a lot of churches like to stay away from because we don't want to um, push people out of the church because it's, it's, it's almost somewhat embarrassing even for some Christians, and that's praying in tongues. And so I'm going to be teaching about what does it mean to pray in tongues why do we pray in tongues why do we pray in the spirit and and maybe you've gotten um some wrong information or maybe you've been in a church setting where it wasn't delivered in a proper way there's a proper way of when to pray in tongues and when not to pray in tongues and when to interpret tongues and so forth so don't miss it i'm really going to break this thing down but today i want to focus on why should we pray why do we need to have a prayer life And once again, if you're someone here that's been saved for like for a bazillion years, you know what I'm saying? This 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 applies to all of us because we've all hit places in our life, seasons in our life where our anxiety was greater than our prayer life. Our depression was greater than our prayer life. That's why the enemy gets a foothold in our life when we stop praying and then the stronghold comes in. And the stronghold comes in to hold you back. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that there's certain things in my life, addictions, habits, uh, mindsets that I just can't break away from? Well, the reason being is because the enemy likes to put strongholds on us and he keeps us from ever seeing the breakthrough or the freedom that God has for us. But it all comes through prayer. Everybody say pray. Pray. Say we got to pray. 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 Remember that song? And the simple reason that, that, that God has given us this amazing language, this amazing key in order for us to unlock all that heaven has for us from healing, restoration, deliverance, all those things, is because God is not someone that has withhold any information from you or me. As a matter of fact, Jesus made it very clear. You have an adversary. You have an enemy. You have an opponent. And, and, and check this out. And it wasn't that Jesus was glorifying Satan. We know John 10, 10 says the thief does not come except to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus would never end a sentence like that. He says, but. And you know, when anyone tells you anything... That sweet, kind, and they add a butt in there. They just erased everything they said, right? Like, you're just so wonderful, but <laughs> you really need to learn how to talk just a little. Okay, I don't want to hear butts. Well, Jesus brought a butt when he said the thief comes to accept to steal, kill, destroy. But I have come to give you life and give you life abundantly. Amen. And so let's start off with, with, with understanding why we need to pray. God has made it very clear to us. We have an adversary. We have an enemy. But let's look at Ephesians 6, chapter 10, quickly. Let's go. 6, verse 10, and we'll read to verse 12. It says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of whose might? His might. This is, listen, this is how we're going to tap into the power of his might. There is no other way to tap into God's power unless we pray. He says, 
put on the whole armor of God. Didn't say put on half an armor, put a piece of the armor on. He says put the whole armor of God, and I won't get into that message today, but God has an armor for us. Why would he have an armor for me? God, why do I need an armor? Because you have an enemy, and you're at war. There's an internal war, and there's an external war. The internal war is the one that God wants to defeat. When God can defeat the internal war, then he can defeat and calm the external war. But it has to start with me. It must begin with me. Prayer may not change your circumstance today, but it will change you. Amen. It will change you. You may have come in here heavy and, 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 and weary and tired or maybe questioning God, but I promise you that by the time you leave this place, you're going to leave with hope, joy, peace, and you're going to know that God is for you, not against you. And so here you have the scripture says, put on the whole armor of God. Get ready for war. And, and it's important that we, we, have, we must put this armor on. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So that you may have the capacity to stand against all of the enemy's uh, strategic plans to destroy you. And he says, for we do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. Here's an easier way to say it amplified version for we do not wrestle against human beings and haven't you noticed we spend most of our time fighting people than fighting the devil right people listen satan has some influence and he does influence people to do things to harm us hurt us but have you ever noticed that you also have harmed and hurt somebody else as well so let's not just talk about the people that hurt me let's also talk about the people that maybe we've hurt and so the enemy does get a foothold when we start kind of step, stepping away from our prayer life. We, 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 are, we, we begin to step into that place of, of hurting people. Why? Because we're no longer sensitive to what God wants us to do with people and how we want to help people, etc. So here he says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not people you're supposed to be fighting, even though people do hurt us. But the, 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 the source of that person is the enemy who's trying to come and and attack me and is trying to push me and and is trying to irritate me it's the enemy so you got to bind the devil you got to bind the devil not bind the person bind the devil pray for the person bind the devil Amen. right and he says and so he says but our, our our battle we wrestle look at this against principalities that's what the guy was talking about against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age and how many know that we live in a dark world man it's so wicked i mean just look at all those you know people that are in government that are smiling as they're as they're signing off to to abort children I mean, that's wicked. It's evil. It's darkness. And I know that you look at the smile and the smirk on their faces as they're signing off, giving the approval for abortions. It's so easy to get mad at that knucklehead that's smiling. But let me tell you something. Behind that smirk is a devil. The person's not the devil. It's the influence that's moving on that person to do things that are weird. Amen? And she says... Um, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places so he starts off by telling us listen you got to put on the full armor and within that verse when he gives us the full armor which you can read on your own read all of ephesians 6 at the very latter part of this verse of 6 and verse 18 and 19 this is how he finishes after you've put on the helmet of of salvation breastplate of righteousness sword of uh, of the spirit belt of truth all those things right he says this and after you put on the armor he says at all times ephesians 6 18 at all times not sometimes not a few times not when you feel like at times he says at all times pray by the power of who the holy spirit so you're not praying out of your head knowledge you're praying from the spirit man that lives inside of you he says and you pray all kinds of prayers they would say all kinds of prayers do you realize that there's over 6,500 languages on this, on this earth? So that means there's all kinds of prayers, right? But there's also all kinds of prayer that the Bible teaches us. Like there's the, there's the prayer of prayer and fasting. There's the prayer of intercession. There's the prayer of declaration. There's the prayer of consecration. There, there's the prayer of prophecy. There's the prayer of song. Do you know that when you sing these songs, even though we're singing words, they're really a prayer to our Heavenly Father. When you realize that when I sing to God, I'm literally praying to God when I sing. 
That is, an, that is an act of worship. When you choose to open your mouth and sing, you are praying. When you choose not to sing, when you withhold your prayer, when you withhold your song, you're withholding heaven to hear your voice. And heaven wants to respond to you. And so it's not a matter of whether I feel like praying. It says you pray always. You always ought to praise what Jesus said and not lose heart. When you stop praying, you lose heart. When you stop praying, you lose joy. When you stop praying, you lose faith. When you stop praying, you lose victory. Prayer is the key, guys. It's the key. It's the antidote. But look what he goes on to say. He says, so he says, pray all kinds of prayers. But be watchful so that you can pray. Be watchful so that you can what? Pray. In other words, pay attention. Pay attention to the moment that maybe you've stopped praying. Like when did you stop praying? If you're still praying, praise God, up your prayer. If you stop praying, pay attention. When did you stop? When did you stop praying always? And he says, so that you can pray again. Always keep on praying for the Lord's, uh, for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me. Pray that whenever I speak, the right words will be given to me. Then and only then, when I ask God to give me the words to speak, I can be bold as I tell you the mystery of the good news of the gospel. So many of us, so many times, we are so good. We are professionals at putting our foot in our mouth, aren't we? Like we open our mouth and we say the most stupidest things to people, right? Have you ever, have you ever done that before? I do that a few times a year like, oh, you goofball, why would you say that? I'll preach on Sunday. I'll, I'll wake up Monday morning like, why did I say it like that? And you just put your foot in your mouth. But listen, this is interesting because he says this. He says, pray that God would give us the words to speak. Like when you're in a confrontation, when you're in a very difficult moment, uh, whether it's at home, at work, or you're correcting your children. Like I know like my kids, I used to bring out the holy belt, you know, because God said, you know, do not spare the rod. And so the holy belt will come out, and, and I would deal with situations like that sometimes. But how many know that beyond doing that kind of disciplinary action, what if we, because listen, you can spank them that hurt, ah, and then they're afraid to do that again. But what if we started giving them wisdom with the discipline? Like what if you were to ask God, God, tell me what to say to my daughter. Tell me what to say to my son so that they not only are afraid of doing this again, but they understand the why they shouldn't do this again. Or when you're dealing with something at work, instead of arguing with your coworker, what if you started praying, God, give me the words to speak to this crazy coworker. Give me a word in season that can literally change this relationship status right now that we have. Heavenly Father, give me the words to speak. When you go for that interview, give me the words to speak where that person who's interviewing me is going to say, where have you been all our life? We've been looking for you. Are you kidding me? See, if we started asking God to give us the words to speak, I think there'd be more favor in our life. I think we would save more time and more energy if we started asking God, how should I respond? What should I say? Tell me how to say it. I have been in difficult situations where people have, have had loved ones go home to be with Jesus. And the first thing I do is I always have to ask God, God, because every situation is different. So I always have to pray, God, how do I deal with this one? Because each one of them are different. And I don't want to be this religious, say the same old thing with every people, with every person I meet with that has lost a loved one. And, and just kind of, you know, not, not, not be a word in season for them. And so there's times where I'll ask God and then, and then I'll start talking to them. And, of course, when someone loses someone, when someone passes away, they don't want to hear anything. They don't want to hear, oh, Jesus loves you. Oh, your, your, your child is a beautiful flower in heaven's garden. It's like, no, man, tell God to get his own flower. Are you kidding me, right? Seriously, we say the most stupidest things sometimes, the most ignorant stuff. And if you ever said that, don't get upset. Just don't do it again. Oh, he needed a little angel for his choir. No, he didn't. That's the given. That's the given. We're all going to heaven. What I'm saying is, what if God gave you a revelation, a word in season that's going to bring hope in a hopeless situation? What if we started speaking words that actually had weight instead of just being so cliche, just trying to talk like this? 
The church needs to have meaning again. The church has to have some, some potent back in its, in, its, in its spirit. We need to begin to speak words of life that literally not only change a person, but change the atmosphere of wherever you are, at your workplace, in your home. When we start speaking, things change. Amen? Hmm. Pray that whenever I speak, that the right words will be given to me. Then... I can be bold. Some of you say, you know what? It's so hard for me to share my faith, Pastor. I can't just, I feel, pray, ask God, God, how do, I, how do I share Jesus with my coworker? How do I share Jesus with my family? They already think I'm crazy. How do I, what do I say? How do I say it? What do I do? If we were just pray, God would respond to us. He would. There's little things. It's the little foxes that spoil the whole vine, isn't it? If we just started asking God, God, you know, just help me. For example, let me give you an illustration here about prayer so I have a I have a beautiful uh, garden we have a lot of vegetation where I live and um, and I, I love my lawn it's beautiful it's green we have a hillside and we have beautiful flowers and and we have roses and we have all kinds of vegetation in my home right and and in order to upkeep that vegetation what do you need what it's expensive you start you start putting those sprinklers on, and, and if you want to keep all that vegetation alive, man, you better, you better water that sucker because if not, that thing's going to dry up and die, right? And so um, I don't like the fact that the bill comes every month, and I'm like, dang, well, here we go again. But I have to pay for it if I want to keep everything green, right? And so California is a place that just, it don't rain, and so now that it's raining, it's like glory to Jesus. It's a hate-love relationship with rain right now. Let me be honest with you. I, I hate rain because it keeps Christians out of church. It's the truth. When it rains, it's the lowest attendance every time for every church worldwide. That's, so that's the hate part. The love part is like, good Lord Jesus, we need some water. I mean, 71% of the earth is made up of water. 68% of our body is made up of water. So we need water on this earth. We need water in this body. 78% of water is inside of an infant when it's born. So water is urgent. Water is important. But water is expensive. And so now that it's been raining, I've been like super joyous. You know why? Because what I do is I turn off my sprinkler system up for like a week or two weeks. And I'm thinking, yes, yes. And the cool part is that my sprinklers, it doesn't hit everything I want it to hit. Have you ever had like bald spots on your grass or anything? I'm like, dang, that sprinkler. Man. It's like you got to put like 10 sprinklers just to hit that one spot. And so I just kind of like, okay, fine, whatever. But now that it's been raining it's a miracle for a lot of us Californians, right? We see water, we're running out there like we're kids. Like we've never, never seen rain before. But now I'm like so excited. I shut off my sprinkler system since December. It's been shutting it off and then I turn it back on like two weeks later. I'm just seeing dollar signs every time I see rain. I'm thinking save, save, save. Yes, yes, yes. Because I have a lot of sprinklers at my home. Well, let me tell you something. What my sprinkler system can't reach rain touches everything it doesn't miss a spot that's what prayer life is like when you pray rain comes down when you pray you save more energy think about it you start trying to work your whole life out however you think you should work it out you put in all the effort all the strength all and you're tired and exhausted what if we were to pray a little bit more what if we were to begin to get God involved in every decision what if we were to bring God back in our homes I hate it when people get upset like oh my god the government they took prayer out of church I mean out of school how dare they let me tell you something we need to stop tripping because we took prayer out of our homes way long before it came out of school oh you don't like that huh? you're like oh it's the truth like, how dare that government? No, listen, you've taken it out of your children. You've taken it out of your, your dinner table, your breakfast table, your lunch table. When was the last time that you prayed for your meal? And so why are we going to complain about the government taking prayer out of school when we have taken prayer out of our homes, out of our work, out of our church, out of every single place? We cannot complain. Then we wonder why. Why are we failing? Why are we so consumed and, and, and filled with, with anger, rejection, unforgiveness, bitterness? Why do we have the stronghold of addiction, the stronghold of all kinds of bad habits and behaviors? I'll tell you why. Because we took prayer out. Prayer is the source. It's the key. 
It's the water that will refresh us. When you pray more, let me tell you something, you will save money. How do, you, how do I save money when I pray? God will tell you when to buy, when to sell, when to invest. God will tell you where to go apply for. God will tell you when to move on. God will bless you when you pray. You'll save energy. You'll save money. Let me tell you something. When you pray... You'll start having things, thoughts of suicide, depression, anxiety, and all these emotional instability things that we deal with. I think that sometimes, if not careful, we idolize our depression. We idolize our anxiety. I'm not saying deny all those things. Those are real things that we deal with. But isn't it so interesting that we pray less when we feel that way instead of praying all the more? Yeah. It's true. I've been there. I have been there. Where I had moments in this church where I was worried. Worried about how we're going to pay that bill. Worried how we're going to do that. We're just, you know, we have a school in Oaxaca, Mexico. We're doing this over here. We're doing, it's, it gets heavy. The weight is heavy. But when I pray, God says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, Mauricio. But when we do it in our own strength, you're exhausted. You're tired. Man, you're weary. You're funky. When people are funky, it's because they stop. They don't, they don't pray. They're funky. It's like, it's like, what's wrong with you now? Uh, like, just go pray. Go kneel. You know what I'm saying? Instead of kneeling at, at the NFL game, man, let's kneel for God. Let's take a real knee. And every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. When was the last time you took a knee for Jesus? Are you hearing me? And so I, I love the rain right now. Like I, I got a better perspective. I'm like, man, I'm saving so much money now. Praise Jesus. I don't even feel like turning it back on. I'm just not like, okay, Lord, just water it every week. <laughs> Think about it. When God waters us, when we pray and he waters us, well, you know what's going to happen to you? You will finally grow up spiritually. You'll grow up spiritually. You'll flourish. It's the only way to stay connected with God. Let me give you a quick definition of prayer. Prayer is very simple. Prayer is God communicating to you. Prayer is God communicating to you. I know that we think, well, prayer is me communicating to God. Well, let's, let's be honest. He started communicating to you before you ever started communicating to him. He reached out to you before you ever reached out to him. And so prayer is communicating to God. That's what prayer is. And prayer in its infancy is the most powerful connection that you and I can ever have. It's the most powerful thing that you and I can, can adopt. It's the most powerful thing that you and I can embrace and get connected with. Because when you cultivate an ear to hear, and you listen, you don't just start praying uh, powerful prayers. You have to develop a prayer life. You have to develop an ear to hear God. I always hear people say, I don't know how to pray. I'm like, well, have you prayed? No. Well, you got to pray in order for you to learn how to pray. You know, we complicate it. I don't hear God. Well, then open your ears. You know, like, what do you mean you don't hear God? Yeah, well, I don't hear God. No, God is speaking today more than ever before. I'll prove it to you. Ready? Look at this. I'm proving it to you right now. First Samuel 3. He didn't speak that much back then. Look, verse 1 through 11. This is a great story about a boy named Samuel. You know, Samuel was a prophet. He's the one that anointed David as king. Eli was his mentor. Eli was a prophet in his time. And here you have Samuel as a young kid. He's being mentored at the school of prayer. Verse 3, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare. The word of the Lord was what? Rare. That means God didn't speak very much. God didn't speak very often. So the word was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And isn't that what everyone is seeking? God, reveal yourself to me. There was no widespread revelation in those times. His voice was rare so just i want you to get this picture because we are blessed they were just crying out to just get a little breadcrumb from heaven we got the whole enchilada now <laughs> verse 2 and it came to pass at that time while eli was lying down in his bed and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. In other words, he got that lazy eye. Look, he was, he was really going to bed. For us, we pray, we get that lazy eye. Right? You start praying, you get tired. Okay, that's not, that's not good. 
verse 3 and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was it says and while Samuel was lying down that the Lord called Samuel and and he answered uh, here I am so he ran to Eli so he's thinking that Eli's calling him so he ran to Eli and he said here I am for you have called me and he said I didn't call you you crazy lie down again and he went and he laid down verse 6 then the Lord called yet again Samuel so Samuel rose and he went to Eli again and said here I am you've called me he answered I did not call you my son lie down again verse 7 now Samuel did not yet know the Lord he did not yet, he wasn't as strong in his relationship with God. Maybe you're not as strong yet with God, but that's okay because everybody has a starting place. You can't get connected with God. You can't grow your relationship with God. And he says, um, so Samuel did not yet know the Lord, uh, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And so he arose and he went to Eli and said, man, you better stop playing around. Here I am for you did call me. I'm right here. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. And therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant, what? Hears. That right there is a simple prayer. Father, speak, Lord, for I hear. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times Samuel Samuel and Samuel answers speak for your servant hears then the Lord said to Samuel let me tell you something what happened here is that Samuel is developing and cultivating an ear to hear from heaven he's learning how to have this 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 intimate relationship with God it says that he yet didn't know the Lord when, when you start reading your Bible, at the beginning, you have yet to know the Lord. As you keep developing that word time, as you keep developing that spending time, as you keep going back to the same, same place again and again, you will begin to develop an ear to hear what God wants to say. Many times you'll read the Bible and you can't understand the words. It's not about what you can understand. It's about the quality of the heart when you spend time with God. Eventually, you're going to hear the voice of God and you're going to be like, what the, what, was, what happened? You'll start hearing things, seeing things, and, and God wants to show you things he wants to reveal things to you and so here you have Samuel this young boy is finally developed this ear to hear God he finally knew now you may think like well God doesn't speak okay well fine don't let him speak to you he can speak more to me but here's the truth the only way that God is ever going to reveal his purpose and plan with you is when he speaks to you he's going to speak it to you through the word you may hear something that God will speak to you through the message today I'm preaching you to you God's word. I'm not preaching you my ideas. I'm preaching to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. God can speak to you through a scripture today. God can speak to you through worship. All of a sudden, there's one lyric. One word from heaven can change you. But you have to cultivate that ear. You have to keep coming again and again and again to church. You can't just come one time and have this amazing experience. Like, oh my God, God is so wonderful. Then you go right back and you default to your old life and think that there's going to be change. It's not going to happen. It's not going to, it was just a tickle me Elmo, you know, situation moment. God doesn't, God, God wants to give you an experience every single day of your life. And so the purest motive of prayer should be, I just want to be with you, God. That should be the purest motive. Nothing else. God will add to that pure motive. But the purest motive of every single person's heart should just be, God, I just want to be with you just want to hang with you look at what first chronicles 4 10 this is jabez jabez has this amazing prayer this is a prayer of faith it's also a prayer of consecration but it's also a prayer of of believing god prophetically for things that he needed look at this it says in verse 4 or chapter 4 verse 10 it says and jabez called on the god of israel he called on who the god of israel hey you know what it wouldn't be weird if you say i pray to the god of israel in the name of jesus That'd be pretty awesome. He says, look at this, saying, everybody say saying, okay. speaking, communicating. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Like, check that. This is his prayer right now. James, like, oh, Lord, I, I'm, I'm saying today, today's Sunday. I pray that you would just bless me indeed. Just bless me today, God. He says, bless me 
indeed and enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain so God granted him what he requested check this out so many times we stop praying because we think God does not want to answer our prayers like I already prayed for that God and give it to me but I think we have to come to the maturity that not everything you pray for is God's will you know what I'm saying and it, but it takes maturity to know that, that there are specific things that you're going to pray for, that it's not that God's trying to keep it from you. It's just that God never called you to it. God has something better for you. God has something much more uh, amazing for your life. God has something that's going to be so much more grandiose than you may not see it now, but I promise you, when you are in alignment with God, when you are filling your well, when you are filling your well with the, the, the wealth of God's word, when you're placing God's word in you, let me tell you something. You will no longer will, will pray the desires of your heart. You will pray the desires of your heart that are lined up with the desires of God's heart. You're now connected with God's heart. You're not praying what you want. You're praying his will, not my will. And when you understand that, then you can pray prayers like this. So here you have Jabez is praying, hey, listen, God. You know, I just ask that you would bless me today. I, I pray that you would enlarge my territory, that you, would, that you would just keep giving me more. Nothing wrong with more. But notice this. There's something very interesting about this prayer. He says that, that, that your hand would be with me. Look at that. That your hand, that your hand would be with me. Huh? If you're a parent, you ever grab your child's hand and you're holding and they're with you and you're just walking. He's, he's saying, I just, I just want your hand to be with me. And that you would keep me from evil, that you would keep me from the temptation, that you would keep me from the destruction, that you would keep me from, from me creating a mess in my life, that you would keep me, protect me, and that you may, that I may not cause pain to anyone. So God granted him that prayer. But check this out. So in this prayer, there's a few points on the screen. So Jabez prayed this. He prayed that God would first, number one, he prayed that he would bless him. You should start off in the morning, God, would you bless me today? bless me bless me with anything you want to bless me with today it could be that someone just buys you a cup of tea a cup of coffee that's a blessing right there it could be that someone holds the door open for you while you're walking to the wells fargo or you're walking to the supermarket what a blessing huh you know i mean it can be this when you start praying with the intention of god bless me you'll start seeing the blessings when you don't pray for god's blessings you never think you're blessed why because your attitude changes when you pray. You now start having gratitude even for the littlest things that you see throughout your day. It's amazing what God will do. So he says, number one, he says, uh, bless me first. Second, he prayed this. He said, expand my territory. How many here want to expand their territory? Maybe right now you live in an apartment. You want to own a house one day. Would you like to expand your territory? Right? Maybe right now only one out of your ten children are saved. Praise God. Right? Well, expand my territory. Lord, I want all my kids to come to know you, Jesus. That's expanding your territory. He's praying, expand my territory. Expand my influence. Expand the wisdom that I need, God, to lead this family, to lead my, my, my workplace, to lead my business. Expand me today. Expand me. So he's praying, expand me. The third thing he prays, he says that God's hand would be upon me. And I want you to know something. When, when you read the prayer of Jabez, the hand represents the presence of God. In other words, he's saying, I pray that your presence would lead me all the days of my life. It represents the presence of God, the person of God, the power of God, and the protection of God. So when you're praying for God's hand, you're praying for his presence. Why? Because where his presence is, you change. When you have no presence of God, you don't change. You're still you. I'm still me. But in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. He changes everything. So when you're praying, God, let your hand be with me today, you're asking for his presence, his person, his power, and his protection. You want another P? Provision. How about that? Five Ps right there. We'll just add that to the media now for 12 o'clock service. The five Ps of prayer. Amen? And so he's asking, he's asking, God, I need your hand. You know why? I, I need you to, to have your heavy hand upon me because when you're going to bless me, God, when you're going to expand my influence, I, I need to be able to continually be able to sustain everything and the more you want to bring in my life. Because sometimes you get too much and it breaks you. 
And so you're praying, God, sustain me in every season of my life as you bless my life. And so prayer is a daily. Everybody say daily. It's a verbal exercise of humility. Yeah. You have to go to God and you have to admit before prayer and say, God, I'm inadequate. But I'm strong in you. God, I admit that I, I fail and, and I miss it, but my dependency is on Almighty God. You start bringing the attention back on Him and you get the attention off of you. You start telling God who He is in your life. You don't start telling God, you know, all the complaints. I get it. It's okay. God can handle our complaints. But God wants us to mature in our prayer and be able to come to Him and say, God, I humble myself. You know, I don't believe in myself, God. I don't believe that I can. I don't believe that I have the smarts to do this, God. I don't believe I have the leadership to do this. It's okay to talk to God like that. But you have to come back with a but. But I believe that you can make it happen in me. But I believe you can give me the guidance and the leadership. But I believe you can give me wisdom. I believe you can give me strategy. I believe that you can give me a plan for this situation. That, that changes the whole game when you start pray, play, praying like that. It's connecting with God when you pray like that. Here's another point. Write this one down. The purpose of prayer is not to get things from God, but it's to get access to God. That's the purpose of prayer, guys. Unfortunately, this is prayer for most Christians. We pray only in crisis. It's like we treat prayer like an ATM card. When we're running low on funds, we go back and we put the ATM card in there and we're like, doo -doo -doo -doo, and then we just expect that God's just going to give us everything we want. No, it's, it's, it's connection. It's, it's, it's developing this, this, this heart of, of I just want to be in your presence. And, and when you start thinking like that, all the things you think you want, all the things you think you need, they'll diminish. And then God gives you clarity of what you need. When you pray, God will be your all-sufficiency everything you won't feel like you lack you will perceive differently you'll look at things differently and so remember we're praying god uh, I, I i just need more of you jesus was the perfect example of that write this down prayer is worshiping god let me explain this um in luke 19 46 it says it is written he said to them this is jesus saying to the disciples he says my house will be a house of prayer but watch this. He says, but you have made it a den of robbers. And I was praying this morning as I was focusing on this message, and I was thinking, like, okay, God, what does this mean? What, what does this? Because I, I know I have so many different interpretations of this verse, but this morning I was asking God, please show me. And God did show me. The Holy Spirit showed me this. When he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of, of robbers, here's what was happening in this scene of context. When, when Jesus was going to prayer, when he was going to the temple to pray, the people had this temple where everyone went at the hour of prayer. The problem was that the people saw an opportunity for business. And so they started rolling in the taco stands, the food trucks, and, and, and I'm not kidding you. They parked it right there at the temple. And that temple no longer became a place of prayer. It became a place of opportunity. And everybody got busy. Instead of being in the temple praying, they were turning up that taco with cilantro, cebolla, salsa, you know. And Jesus walking by like, what are you doing? He's like, Psst. even the disciples were stopping by like, hey, man, we're going to get a, a hamburger real quick. And it got wild. And so Jesus said, what in the world is wrong with you guys? You have turned the house of prayer into a den of robbers. In other, in other words, here's the revelation he gave me this morning. When you don't pray, you rob you and you rob God. I'll say it even a step further. When you don't pray, you know that you're busy with everything else but God. That's why the children of Israel, the Bible says, and they ate themselves out of the promise of God. And we live in a society where we are distracted by social media, by entertainment, by problems, by issues. But when you pray, it brings focus back. Here's another part of the revelation here. Jesus said, and you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
That means that when I say, we're the church, that's where you say, amen. Why? Because you are the church. And in this church, this is where God resides. And out of this church inside of me, this is the house of prayer. You get it? And so when you don't pray, you're robbing you. You're robbing yourself. You've made yourself a den of robbers. You're robbing yourself from peace. You're robbing yourself from joy. You're robbing yourself from clarity. You're robbing yourself from direction. You're robbing yourself from healing. You're robbing yourself from deliverance. When this house does not pray, we rob ourselves. Are you getting this? And so, but when you pray, God will provide. When you pray, God will give you favor. When you pray, you will no longer feel lonely. When you pray, you'll no longer be desperate. When you pray, you won't be hurting as much. When you pray, you won't be as disappointed, right? So you have to let your prayers match your problems. That's what Jesus showed us in the scriptures. Worship team, you can come up. Let's get out of here. Let me give you this, this last part. Turn off your phone. You're distracted. You're robbing yourself. Listen, Jesus is having a disappointing time, a difficult, tormenting moment right now in his life. This is right before he's going to be arrested and placed on the cross, and he has to now sacrifice his life, give his life for our life because of our sins. And so Jesus comes to this very agonizing moment where he's hurting, and he goes to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, check out this. Everything that God has done, God has done it with, with purpose, with meaning. Out of all places that Jesus would pick to go pray, he picks a garden called Gethsemane. Why did he pick this garden? Well, here's why. In this garden, and I've been to this garden in Israel, it's, it's just, and it's not that big, it's very small. It is, it is filled with olive trees everywhere. And when you study the Greek or the Hebrew word, sorry, the Hebrew word of Gethsemane, that Hebrew word of Gethsemane means the place of press. Why do they call that the place of press? Because that was the place where they would go into the garden and they would extract the olive oil from the olives. And that's what took place there. Jesus was showing us when you are pressed with the pressures of life, that is the time where you have to press all the more. When you're being pressured, the only decompression is prayer. It's the only thing. Remember, Jesus prayed this. He said, Lord, Father, if you can remove this cup from me. And we know that his cup was a cup of suffering. And maybe you, some of you right now, you have a cup that you don't want to drink. It's the cup of forgiving someone who's hurt you. It's the cup of releasing that bitterness and that resentment. It's the cup of finally accepting the truth that Jesus is your Lord and He's your Savior. And without Him, you'll never have eternity. Maybe right now you have a cup of suffering with your family, your children. Maybe there's a cup of suffering of your body not working or functioning properly. Maybe there's a cup of cancer that you're swallowing right now. And Jesus prayed, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. But prayer gave him the attitude and the response to say, but not my will. Let your will be done. See, you have to learn how to take the cup and swallow it. And the only way you swallow that cup is prayer. Prayer. I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to give me fish oil. I used to hate that. Ben pa'ca, Mauricio. I'm like, no, ma. I'd be running around all over the place as a little kid. And she's like, if you drink it, I'll give you a gummy bear. Okay. It's five. And she would give me the gummy bears, and then she's like, and it's, prayer is the sweetness in order to swallow the suffering. It's the only sweetness. Prayer will make your suffering sweet. Prayer will sustain you when you can't. Prayer will keep you when you can't anymore. When you want to give up, when you want to quit, prayer will keep you from quitting. Prayer will keep you from giving up. Prayer will keep you from staying in the same place, the same year, after year, after year. 
Prayer may not change your circumstance in the moment, but prayer will have to change you. Jesus said in Luke 1, and men always ought to pray and not lose heart. We got to pray, church. We got to invite prayer back in our life. We got to invite prayer. We got to invite heaven. We got to invite his presence, his person, his power, his provision, his protection back in our life. But unless you open your mouth and pray, nothing's going to happen. You must pray. You have to pray. He said, pray daily. He didn't pray. Say, pray when you feel like it. Pray when you're in crisis. Pray when you're in trouble. Pray when you want a husband. Pray when you want a, a, a wife. He didn't say pray like that. He said, pray so that we connect. Pray so that I give you strength. Pray so that I give you might. Pray so that I give you joy. Pray so that I bring you my peace. Pray, pray, pray. He's saying, don't rob yourself from prayer. Prayer literally will change and transform your life. Stop being so consumed with what everybody else did and pray. And watch heaven come like rain. Watch heaven water your garden. Watch heaven not only water your garden, but he will not miss one spot in your life. He will water every area of your life. He'll water your health. He'll water your finances. He'll water your marriage. He'll water your children. He'll water your work. He'll water your... He will rain on you and he doesn't miss anything. Anything. That's what prayer does. Stand to your feet. Let's pray. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.